Good afternoon. Now I'm giving you my regular good afternoon. And I only needed to do it once. Okay. It is a special pleasure to introduce to you today one of my closest colleagues in my work at home and abroad that focuses on the central role that citizens play in making democracy work. I guess you might say that we are on parallel tracks in that regard with one noticeable difference. Parallel lines never meet. And Elzbieta and I meet as often as possible. We've been together in New York and Scranton, Warsaw and Krakow, Bethlehem, Palestine, Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some places. Yeah, Scotland. Oh, so, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Belfast. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, it's it's uh, true, if not a legend, that Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest. <laughs> and while that is not the most eloquent compliment that this very eloquent orator gave, we'll take it because Democracy is an ideology, if you will, that understands that people are not angels and that we make mistakes. Democracy takes that into consideration. It is not a closed system and it is not a top-down society. It is always, eternally, a work in progress. We have challenges today that we need to address. The good news, as well as the bad news, is that it is we who must address them and in the light of day and in the spirit of transparency. No one can do it for us and it can't be done in secret. And so Elzbieta Matinya, a professor of sociology and liberal studies and director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies at the New School for Social Research in New York City, will talk to us today on the fact that democracy lives in the sunlight and alas, also dies in darkness. Please welcome her to the podium. Did Sandra tell you that I'm actually Polish and that I came from Poland? And things in Poland are not well when it comes to democracy. And um, whenever we look, you know, whenever we look, things with democracy are not well. But I, I am go going to actually to focus mostly on Poland, although because of the recent events and because of what we are going here through uh, right now, and because I'm also American, uh, uh, you will see here a lot of a lot of references to 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 our context, to the context, the moment in which we live. Um, and I don't know whether you remember, but it was over a year ago, in late February 2017, that the Washington Post appeared uh, uh, in, in the newsstands with a disturbingly uh, unfamiliar motto: "Democracy dies in darkness." Though it had been discussed by the editorial board for more than a year before, uh, and, and more than a year before our recent elections, presidential elections, the phrase became really a motto of the Post only one month after Donald uh, Trump moved into the White House, and was greeted with uh, some controversy. Um, unlike the motto introduced by uh, the New York Times 115 years ago, that 16 years ago now, I think, um, that we all know all the news that fit the print, that fit the print, uh, this one, democracy dies in darkness, was initially considered too negative. But was it actually? The Post executive editor Martin Baron might have been showing some foresight when he stated that certain institutions have a very important role in making sure that there is light. Some of you may have actually seen uh, the very recent October issue of, of The Atlantic um, with a front page title um, displaying the theme of, the, of that issue. Um, Dying uh, uh, is democracy dying. That's the title of the Atlantic, October issue of the Atlantic. Uh, so, although I know, uh, I, I know I'm regarded by, by some, 
and I think that's uh, something that I share with very much with Sandra. But also, but most of my my friends that I'm uh, some kind of a sucker for hope. I would like to put um, a, really. I would like to put a more positive ring to it. I don't like to think that democracy is dying, and I want you to be with me in that <laughs> in that belief. Um, uh, I think, uh, and to think in terms, uh, I like to think not in terms of dying, but of, of various possibilities, perhaps, of being reborn, or new, or recreated. I even think uh, the most recent developments in and around the Senate, in particular this last Friday, might offer some ray of hope. Uh, for starters, let me try to explain how I uh, I think I fit into this discussion. I'm a Polish born, as I said, and, um, and educated there and here, American sociologist who subscribes to a dramaturgical concept of, the so of society. Society that is not predetermined by historical um, uh, necessities, as Marx would like. Uh, like it, but this, but society that has a range uh, a range of actors, a polyphony of voices, uh, inevitable uh, tensions and conflicts that arise from that, and above all, a capacity to conduct a dialogue in public, which is uh, through, through which a consensus concerning oh, the place we live in, the social order, conflicts that are happening around us, um, the consensus can be reached. In my book, in my, in my former, uh, earlier book, Performative Democracy, I talk about the dimension uh, of political life that occurred in the uh, later part of the 20th century, something that, that I spent time thinking, something also that I myself very personally uh, experienced and went through. Uh, a dimension of political life uh, in both, in both uh, non-democratic and democratic context. A dimension closely related to uh, what I call politics of hope. Um, and, um, and, and just to be clear, what I call performative democracy is, is not a theoretical model um, it's not a, a, or political ideal. It's not a tested system of governance, but it's a locally conditioned process of either uh, enacting democracy or enhancing a democracy by its citizens, and acting. That's the word I want us to, to keep in mind. I began my book uh, with, a, with an essay. The book was really about Poland, because I, here I came from this miraculous place that was autocratic, authoritarian, totalitarian, and, and got, got, got out of it, right? So I began uh, my book with an essay, Staging Freedom. It's called Staging Freedom. Um, and where I try to show the gradual construction of embryonic, really initial public sphere as it occurred within uh, various initiatives in still communist Poland, such as alternative theater movements that erupted in Polish universities in the 70s, and, uh, very courageous, actually very courageous acts. Uh, which were possible because they were framed as theaters, so the government didn't pay much attention to it, and the, and the audience was fairly limited. After all, some students, you know, they are going to grow up and they're going to work, and um, nothing is going to happen. But it was really uh, uh, the first time that people were able to, to meet and to, to speak to each other. Those people who were speaking were, of course, on stage, but there was also an, an audience, and then there were discussions. So that was um, a, a graduate. I tried to show this kind of uh, how this contributed to a graduate loosening of the constraints of the system, and how it initiated a whole generation of young intelligentsia into democratic thinking. Something that we were not uh, trained to think <laughs> this way. Uh, democratic thing. There is some irony, of course, in that. I have to mention that, that, as I say, these theater performances were overlooked by the communist uh, government that saw so little danger in such a limited gatherings. Indeed, in the, um, at the core of 1989 revolution, which 
brought about the collapse of Iron Curtain, uh, dismantling of the Iron, uh, uh, Iron Curtain, but also collapse of the Berlin Wall and so on, was these germinations, which were decades uh, uh, earlier, uh, took place decades earlier, germination of public space um, and whether that was a theater or later on when solidarity movement was, uh, um, uh, had emerged, those were factories or universities or churches. This is where people met. And this is when people met on their own terms. They came there because they wanted to come and talk to each other. And that was the beginning of that, of that kind of creation and appreciation of what I call public realm. And I will be talking a lot about it here. Um, you know, those, those meetings, and I, I just wanted to, to, to say that because I was there, um, we, never, we never participated in anything like that. It was almost visceral. You were so happy that you can talk and listen to others and that nobody's afraid. And it's, and it's very difficult to convey it. This is why I came up with this kind of line or title, performative democracy, because it doesn't fit to anything else. It's just as I say, a dimension of democracy. Uh, and so the, I'm talking about because freedom, it's actually not very tangible when you think about it. It is so like a crisp air that allows us to breathe. It's normal for those who live in freedom. But really only when it becomes alive, and that's what happened to us then, um, and uh, alive and embodied, it can appear in the public, it kind of gets this public um, uh, shape, form. But for freedom to become truly performative, not only speech, the fact that people can talk to each other, but a public space is needed. And often we don't pay attention to that. We often talk about the, the, the freedom of speech. We somewhat don't think too much. Of course, we talk about the freedom of gatherings, it, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the the freedom is maybe in that gathering image. But space is very important, safe space where people can meet and encounter each other and talk to each other. Hannah Arendt calls that thing space of appearance. You don't have freedom if you cannot actually appear in public and talk in public to each other. She calls it this. She was a German philosopher, as you know, and, and she came up with sometimes um, uh, strange, strange um, terms, but that space of appearance, it's her, it made a huge career in, um, in uh, both political life, but also within political theories. It's a space where one can be and not be afraid and talk. And it's really, um, I, I, I refer, like, when I talk about it, I refer it, um, and I will be referring it to as to public square, a site when freedom is more solid and more visible. Uh, I apologize for a little bit kind of conceptual playing here with you, but it will be a little bit more specific when I come, uh, when I go further. So indeed, the relationship between active freedom, freedom that could be enacted, and the public square are reciprocal. Uh, because without freedom, the public sphere shrinks and eventually vanishes. And without a politically, a politically guaranteed public realm, freedom does not have a space in which to appear. The conditions for freedom's performativity uh, are only present when the long, for long time, unused words, words which we kind of often disappear, uh, forgot, action-oriented words, come, um, uh, they, they come out of the hiding spaces. They come out from hiding into a private realm, squeezing itself through the cracks into the open. And at that very moment, when it is first heard, it instigates the emergence of, a, of, the, of the undeniably public realm. Among those people who helped me to think about this were two philosophers of dialogue and emancipation, um, a refugee from Nazi Germany, Hannah Arendt, I mentioned her, uh, and a, a, a bit less known, Mihail um, uh, Bakhtin, a Russian, brilliant Russian philosopher of culture, banished uh, in Stalin, uh, Stalin's Russia, 
um, an exile first to Kazakhstan and then to some completely marginalized, uh, obscure oblast, Mordovia, uh, in 1970s. He could not. He could not. Very few people knew about him at that time. Um, but, uh, but the foundation for hope and, uh, and a democracy-oriented performative strategy for the societies, especially in, East, in Central Europe, had already been uh, laid out in the 70s uh, in three key essays written by authors from the region. Uh, the, the one essay, love the title, is called Hope and Hopelessness by a um, uh, Polish philosopher living in exile and teaching in Oxford, Leszek Kołakowski, late Leszek Kołakowski. The second one, New Evolutionism, um, an essay by a young unemployed historian from Warsaw, and I think you've met him here at least once in, um, in, in, in this community that you have here in uh, uh, the University of Scranton. His name is Adam Michnik. And the third one, the third essay, is The Power of the Powerless, and by a playwright from Prague whose plays were banned in Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel. Um, what they did in those essays, what they discussed in those essays, they kind of exposed, exposed the contradictions, ironies, absurdities of the system to the people, of the authoritarian regime, mostly at the level of language. They just said, you know, this is what they say. Well, let's just say, is this really a worker's paradise? Is, do workers have anything to say in this workers, uh, workers uh, is, uh, regime, workers countries, workers states? Well, as you know, they didn't, and they were killed, and they were shot at, and they, when they went on strike, they were beaten, and they were, so, so, so just talking about it was courageous, um, but exposing those contradictions, as I say, and also with, with all its broken promises and contracts and uh, a kind of hidden discourses, uh, those dissident authors that I just mentioned showed that those contradictions could be exploited without recourse to violence in their contest with the regime. So Kowakowski, Michnik, and Havel ask people not to expect miracles or help from outside uh, or some automatic self-correction of the author authoritarian system. Instead, they made a case for small incremental changes. Let's be patient, but let's do it. Let's do it and let's be, um, and let's be systematic in, uh, and consistent in, in, uh, keep in, in doing it. The emergence um, of, this, of Polish solidarity, this unique nationwide union of trade unions, whose legal existence was impossible, it seemed it was impossible, but yet it was then negotiated by the workers with the communist government, was in many ways a masterpiece of performative democracy. It was then when people really discovered both the taste for democracy and their own capacity to perform, performative capacities. They self-discovered that they can speak, that they, that, 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 that they are this autom autonomously speaking I. Um, they, they became citizen actors of that movement. And they forced the stage to engage in dialogue with them. Such voices or speech acts are the key element of performative democracy, and real dialogue does not incite hate, speech, or violence. When an electrician, Mustachio's electrician, you may remember him, Lech Wałęsa, uh, who led the strike, proclaimed, got out on the little car on the top of the car and proclaim, we will have our independent self-governing union solidarity, our own paper published here during the strike will become our union paper and we will be able to write without censorship whatever we want. We have the right to strike. His speech distributed through, throughout the country became one of the most emblematic moments of performative democracy of 20th century. Let me just kind of leave it a little bit behind. Uh, although I have to say the most spectacular, of course, uh, uh, instance of performativity was the climactic drama of the round table talks that took place in the spring of 1989 in Warsaw. Uh, the round table talks 
The regime didn't have much choice. It had to meet citizens. It had to meet people that yesterday went in prison. It had to meet, meet dissidents. And it was very difficult. On one side, you have those who were yesterday prisoners. And on the other side of the table, you have their prison guards yet. Uh, the, un, un, uh, uh, the, the, something unimaginable, what was un, unimaginable happened. And uh, when the uh, roundtable talks, which they took six uh, weeks, were concluded in April 1989, um, the communist regime in the region had, um, which in the region it still seemed to be uh, actually quite robust, uh, but as it turned out, it was not. Um, and then various things happened, and you know about it, very telegenic, uh, um, knocking down the, 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 the Berlin Wall, and so on. And so inherently, the real work of hammering <laughs> um, around the round table was not as uh, was not as attractive, I think. Agreements and speech alone is not as attractive, but when people showed up, showed up to dismantle the wall, that became the symbol of the change. Um, performative democracy, though in, inherently uh, dramatic, formed uh, in the process of speaking and listening to others, is a joyous and affirmative dimension of the political. I think that we forgot that there's something like public happiness exists, not private, but public, that we could be all happy, <laughs> that we could be happy doing things. And, I, and, 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 and the, the dimension, performative dimension of, 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 of democracy has that, uh, has that in it. Um, it releases a robust cre uh, civic creativity. It helps the bowed backs to straighten up. Um, it is truly transformative for those who are engaged, as it launches a process of learning, forming opinions. People can learn democracy, learn thinking democratically, um, reasoning and speaking. And this brings about change. It is clearly an alternative to tanks and, bullet, and it, bullets, and it uh, creates condition for the recovery of people's lost dignity. However, like a carnival, because it does feel like a carnival, uh, the dimension of democracy that I call performative, especially in its most fervent moments, uh, that dimension does not last forever. It is a temporary phenomenon. Um, it constitutes uh, the early stages of democratic project. I think this is the, the best example of performative is when democracy is being created. I think we, in America, you, we had it in the, in the past, the debates of the um, framers of the constitutions. The fun, we had, every democracy has it. Um, but it is temporary phenomenon. Um, so it's either early stages of democratic process or performative democracy can kind of be brought in to provide strategies to keep democracy vibrant during the time of Lent, <laughs> if there was a carnival, well, maybe, let's say, drought, just to be on the safe side, um, at, at the time of drought, of democratic drought. So it emerges uh, uh, in one place as an enabler of new democracy to be born or to be reanimated when, as often happens in older democracies, it has become too complacent uh, and taken for granted. The public square is still alive there, along with the institutions of parliamentary democracy, political parties, regular elections, free media, and non-governmental organizations advocating their cause. But what begins to disappear is that Bakhtinian, I remember that Russian philosopher I mentioned upsurge of human ingenuity uh, in forming new relationships between individuals and inventing new ways of being together, new social forms. What's um, 
what is often advancing in the period of democratic uh, drought is compl uh, complacency, intellectual poverty, and abuse. Adam Michnik, you had Adam Michnik here, and this is a, a person who probably there's more legends about him uh, than about anybody else. A brilliant thinker and, and, and a person who loves, I wish I had the talent to, talk, to, to, to start and to, to end with jokes, with stories, with parables. So when he was here recently, um, he told me one, he, we discussed things, and he said, well, uh, it goes like that. In, if in 1987, so two years before the, begin, the, 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 the beginning of democracy in Poland, if in 1987 God had asked the Poles, what do your three most fervent v wishes are? Or where? They would have said, First, we want to live in a country with no political prisoners. Second, we want a country without censorship and foreign armies. And third, we would like the Soviet Union to fall apart. <laughs> we, uh, and, and the good Lord listened to Paul's, and all three wishes came through. We got freedom. And today, God is asking the Poles, so what have you done with that freedom? Well, the time is out of joint. At the beginning of Hamlet, when his close friend, when Hamlet's close friend, Horatio, arrives to comfort the prince, Hamlet shares with him in confidence that strange things are happening in Denmark, around this court and palace. He actually says, the time is out of joint. How is it that democracy made such a U-turn and that we are now trembling as we watched its massive reversal? And when we look around, we see that de-democratization, under various guises, is taking place virtually everywhere. <coughs> the time is out of joint, indeed. So what went wrong? John Adams, in his 1814 polemical letter to the Republican legislator John Taylor, spelled out, yes, he was provoked, but he, he wrote, and he spelled out one of his darkest projections where he wrote, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, wastes exhausts and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. I don't know about you, but I don't want to side with John Adams, even though you may not know my name. Actually, I have American name, and I'm actually Adams. Yes, with Anthony Adams, I'm not siding with Adams, with neither that Adams. Um, I'm not siding with John Adams when it comes to democracy in general. But as I myself suggest, have suggested, the performative dimension of democracy doesn't last forever. And perhaps it doesn't have to. It emerges in the first place like a midwife to help democracy be born. Or, as I said, it reappears when democracy becomes too complacent in the case of uh, uh, or um, taken for granted or turned into an imitation and needs to be reanimated. In the case of new democracies, it stays with us only for a while, as soon as other dimensions of democracy begin to play a key role, it's gone. 
Um, this is when um, not yet democratic uh, countries, in not, in not yet democratic contexts, the institutions of solid parliamentary democracy are built, when democratic constitutions are drafted, and procedures of the rule of law at the center are established. When political parties, which in Europe, as you know, represent an array of position, concerns, and voices. And uh, there was a moment in Poland that early on in, in the 90s that it was something like 70 political parties, and they all tried to get to the parliament. One of them was called the party of the beer lovers. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm sorry. I just didn't. I just only now connected with something which is happening in this country. The party of the beer lovers. Yeah, they never got to the parliament, but they actually had quite a constituency, I should say. Mm, didn't know. Yes, sorry. So, um, uh, represent in Europe, represent an array of, po of positions, concerns, and voices. So, this is when uh, the parties compete in regularly scheduled elections. Uh, this is when specialized non-governmental -govern organizations start keeping an eye on government and the parliament and advancing for the chosen social causes. Um, and self-government, local authorities decide about matters concerning the respective communities. Now, that was all done in Central Europe. That was all done in Poland. Took time, but it was done. And that was done in the post-communist countries, which are now a member of the European Union. Well, let's look at Poland today, for example. Poland. The economy is booming. Never had 2008 crisis. Never. The country looks more modern, affluent, and attractive uh, every day. And there was a stock market located in another little irony um, on the prime state, real estate, the former headquarters of the Central Committee of the United Workers' Party, which was the Communist Party now. Communist, the headquarters of the Communist Party is stock exchange. Uh, and good, I mean, you know, and they obviously are, yeah, people are saving money there, whatever, they, they, they function very well. Um, all of the, Poland is doing exceedingly well. The borders of Europe are no more. And one doesn't have to feel like a poor cousin when visiting Paris or Scranton. <laughs> and yet something has gone wrong. Why is a society that was once so united in non-violently -viol ending the long rule of communism, now so fiercely divided? Why is diversity of people, opinions, cultures, and beliefs shunned? Why has generosity gone? Where has generosity gone? Why is the vital norm of mutual tolerance and forbearance vis-a-vis -vis political opponents vanishing? Why is it so difficult to shed that old belief in a conspiracy against the nation? Why are the liberal media, that's mostly about Poland because I don't think it's a case here, and former dissidents who lang languished in prison for their pro-democratic stance are treated now with such a vitriol? And why is violence entering the square of politics? In other words, what is undermining or trumping Poland's liberal democracy, or ours for that matter? The struggle in Poland is also about the judiciary branch, whose independent status is being dismantled step by step. Last year, President Duda signed a law meant to fill the judiciary with judges friendly to the party in power. A move that further strained relationship between Poland and the European Union. Huge citizens' protests in defense of the Constitution have been conducted for more than a year now. And I'm, I'm saying massive. 
last month the monuments of famous Poles erected throughout centuries in various towns and cities were dressed in a very popular t-shirt with the word this is my performative act <laughs> Constitucja uh, this part which is constitution of it, right? This part, T-Y, T, means you. This part, J-A, Ya, means I. Why I'm talking about it? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a beautifully designed, I think. It was first a poster, and then it ended up on the T-shirts, as, as always. Um, uh, so as I say, the, those, those, those monuments have been dressed in those T-shirts all over Poland. Um, um, but when the monument of a bit more liberal twin brother of a current leader of the ruling uh, ultra-right-wing party in Poland. Now his name is Kaczynski, and he had a twin brother. And the other brother, who, as many say, was a bit more liberal, has died in this awful crash um, with the government going to the, uh, 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 the plane crash a government and parliamentary uh, uh, delegation full, 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 full plane crashed in uh, uh, Smolensk, which is east, east, uh, east of Poland in, uh, in what was uh, before Soviet Union. When his monument, because he's dead and he's being celebrated, was, was dressed in that, um, the police got an order to actually uh, check, you know, to, to uh, and not only, not only, uh, but after that event, people who wear that could not wear it anymore. Because you could be stopped by the police, you could be interrogated, you could be harassed, and you could be punished. So, where I, if I were in Warsaw today and not in Scranton, I might be. I might be arrested for wearing this affirmation of the democratic constitution uh, passed in 1997 in Poland by the Polish parliament. The situation is alarming. Uh, here, like there, as today's sharp political divisiveness begins to look like a caricature of a Schmittian, Karl Schmidt, a brilliant but incredibly controversial and problematic uh, theorist, a legal and political theorist of Nazi Germany, living in Nazi Germany. Um, a, as today's political divisiveness looked like a caricature of the Schmittian concept of the political. For him, political, many of you know that, um, needed, was best necessarily based on a sharp distinction between friend and enemy. There is no middle ground. There is no politics if you do not watch, look, um, comprehend the world in terms of friend and enemy. Um, and I think that this precious middle ground is indeed dramatically shrinking in both, independently of his theory, um, both um, new and old democracies, whether in Poland or in America. What's perhaps most uncanny is that the new political environment is actually deriving its energies precisely from a democratic context that enables mobilization through existing freedoms. Democracy allows democracy allows, gives people freedom to act and it is very easily hijacked in the process. All these movements 
emerged in the name of the people. Um, it is the will of the people, we the people, acting against the betrayal by the power elite against those who, um, with the constant compromises, do not represent us against their moral relativism, their promotion of secular, secularism, against corruption and governing practices that nobody can follow, against our sense of being marginalized and abandoned in our own country. Here we are, speaking with one voice, we the people, to defend the threatened cohesiveness of our national community, our culture, our right to a way of life based on our own values. Though the word democracy doesn't appear in that at all. Democracy and populism, and it is populism that I that I focus on here, that I use here, um, both arise from the same stimulus. And the progressive phrase, we, the people, is a clear mark of this shared origins. However, at the core of today's populist right is an ethno-nationalism that, with, an, uh, with its idea of native homogeneity, and oneness targets precisely the most obvious obstacles, um, obstacle, which is pluralism, a key future, feature of liberal democracy. I'm going to drop a piece, and maybe we can go back to it. But uh, there are a few issues. Detectives, detective uh, work sorts of issue, issues that I'm left with and would like to share them with you. If we agree that we are private agents working on behalf of the public good, that we are, which is for me the best definition of civil society, um, we should have a lot of questions. One of the questions is what had happened to democracy. Though it is perhaps too vast and too overwhelming, so so perhaps we shall we shall narrow it down. Is democracy this political ideal of the modern age, long the aspirational goal of people everywhere, and the reality that people still treasure? being legitimately hijacked before our very eyes. Are its citizens actors, who at the same time are members of the public? Are these actors of democracy concerned about freedom and the accountability of power, now being replaced by some homogeneous with the, we the people? Is public space the Arantian space of appearance that makes a public life possible? Shrinking. In a democracy, this is not a private space anymore. It is public setting where people can come together and interact through speech. As I have mentioned, in Poland, such a space was furnished by a theater, art galleries, and later uh, during early solidarity uh, gatherings, factories, universi universities, and churches. To occupy such a space was to open the first crack in the authoritarian regime's embrace. This was where the conversation and dialogue began to take place in public without fear, and where people could meet and get to know each other. But is shrinking the public square and turning it into a wave of populism, uh, through a wave of populism into a Potemkin village of democracy, necessarily a crime. After all, this has been spearheaded and accomplished by what what's appeared to be the will of the people. Why is that a crime? But if it is, who is guilty? Well, even if closing the public square and turning it into 
an official state square, Putinesque state square. Russia is democracy, they have elections, right? State square, not public square, is what dominate their uh, life there. And even if the social silencing that comes with it does not sound like criminal activity, the more specific charge, the killing of dialogue, is criminal activity. What do I mean by that? The real objective of social silencing, I need a tissue badly. <laughs> um, the real objective of social silencing, if you can help me, um, a frequent phenomenon of authoritarian regimes is to deactivate and dismantle the public. Thank you so much. I left New York completely well, and I don't know where my knapsack is now, so thank you. The real objective of social silencing, a frequent phenomenon of authoritarian regimes, this is when you replace the public square with state square, um, is to deactivate and dis dismantle the public square, the agora, a site where people can freely experience each other and, ment and meet those who may not be like us. My fa uh, favorite South African writer, Nadine Gordimer, opened one of her essays on apartheid with, this, with, a, with a sentence, men are not born brothers. They have to discover each other. And it is in the encounter with others that we become aware of the limited makeup of our own knowing. Stay with me for a second, that's not easy. Limited makeup of our own knowing, and therefore of our own ignorance, superstition, or prejudice. Even if not primary site for generating knowing, the public square is a site of dialogue where the rigidity of ideological claims can be challenged and competitive discourses can be presented, confronted, and examined. So what about the question of guilt? The answer is we are guilty. We are implicated in that crime. Though perhaps it was just a crime of neglect. We in Poland neglected both speaking and listening to each other. And we did not uh, do much when the middle ground was attacked or eradicated. Bipolarity and nothing in between. This is what allowed the silencing to take place. We did not listen. We did not listen. In the United States, we, the liberal intelligentsia, we from the East and West Coast, did not want to see and did not want to listen to those in between in what we know only as flyover country. Our country is seen from a plane. Similarly, in Poland, we did not listen and we did not want to talk to each other. The successive centrist governments, very successful otherwise, did not think that they had to explain much, of, uh, much to those whom they governed. But, that, but that's uh, not only about the arrogance of the government. It's also about uh, one half of our society. Since we neither talked nor, nor listened, we lost touch. We failed to remember the principle of solidarity with those who had landed in a hard place. I'm not talking here about empathy, but about social solidarity, a sense of team spirit and shared responsibility for the hardships of others. After all, this is what once brought us together and gave us strength. Polish historian and former political prisoner Karol Modzelewski pointed out correctly that all that's left of the Trinity uh, 
maxim of the French Revolution today is liberté, while the two other, uh, while other two, égalité and fraternité, are gone. Even if we ourselves did not directly silence those two principles, we did nothing to stop the silencing. In Poland, while understanding that a successful transition to democracy required building a successful market economy, and initially everybody had to tighten their belts, once we already achieved an impressive measure of economic success, the idea of perhaps sharing some of that with the society at large was hardly present. Again, a crime of neglect, which led not only to mounting distance in communication, but also the mounting distance resulting from economic inequality between the haves and the haves not. In this situation, the choice between a sometimes lonely freedom and the chance for some security begins to look less difficult, and um, an inclination towards security, heightened by the comfort sense of belonging to a community of folks like oneself is perhaps more justifiable. I won't get into uh, it just now, but in the US, uh, where I belong to the 99%, the gap uh, has become even more dramatic after the passing of recent laws that further subsidize the increasingly non-representative American plutocracy. In Poland, the shutting of, public, of the public square creates a situation in which the theater of, of public life, it's not possible anymore, with sites and sources for getting to know and understand the other disappear. The knowing has become misknowing. A misknower believes that he knows, and certainty is a trademark of his knowing. This means the destruction of society's political capacities through silencing and the engineering of a mute society. A very high price to pay for one's neglect. To finish my reflection on this double crime we've committed, the killing of a dialogue and the killing of solidarity, let me uh, just bring quickly Arendt again. Because if we, if we were ever uh, if, if, if there were uh, ever a handbook for the professionals of silencing, or as Arendt calls them more directly, functionaries of violence, it would instruct us to focus first on dismantling the public square by erecting boundaries. And this act creates the conditions for a modern tyranny to take over. And this point is usually, at this point, it is usually too late when even limited interactions are controlled, staged and directed, communication is inhibited, and where only one voice is heard, coming anonymously through loudspeakers. Ignorance is rewarded through the bestowal of a comfortable kind of certainty. So how do we stop the descent into authoritarianism and into darkness? how to bridge the canyons of mistrust, how to bring some light back, how to proceed. Well, we have to go back, well, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to rediscover the possibility of public dignity and happiness as afforded by the dimension of democracy I called performative. At the beginning of democracy, there is always a word, a publicly spoke, speak, spoken word in the agora, space of appearance. Performative democracy is born, above all, from speech acts and the conversations of concrete people who discover that they have things in common. That discovery is further, further communicated when they turn the encounter into performance, accessible to all. And also, when they turn their words, charged with practical consequences, into social facts, when they enact them. But how to start a conversation with a woman and men who feel they are regarded as some unsightly old furniture, neither suitable nor indispensable for a free market economy, for a new free market economy? 
for a democracy run by specialists or even by a professionalized civil, civil society at large. Perhaps the best known confirmation of that sense was a humorous SMS sent before prior elections in Poland, 2007 parliamentary elections in Poland, uh, which was quickly embraced, SMS quickly embraced by the youngest generation of voters, afraid that the right-wing parties might be re-elected. That was the time when the president and the prime minister, both twins, were in charge of the Polish government. So here comes the SMS. The elections are coming. Save your country. Hide your, gr your grandma's ID. Uh, obviously, without their identity uh, card, grandmothers could not vote, and the ruling party, whom they support, would lose seats, and their government would be driven out of office. The message, though funny, and reflecting the popular opinion that older people tend to vote for conservative parties in Poland, like the one run by the Kaczynski brothers, was problematic clearly problematic, and not just legally. And I think we in the United States, we are aware of the different ways in which voter suppression is car carried out. The Poland right-wing parties lost in that election, not because of the SMS, I guess, uh, but they did lo uh, lose in, the, in that election. The new liberal government did nothing, actually, to the elderly, the poor, the parochial, those out of oblivion. Though it was clear that the idea of the EU, European Union, was often difficult to comprehend by people. So I'm not Paul anymore, I'm now just European. What does that mean? Um, so it was difficult for many people. Um, there was no conversation about it. There was little effort to create a narrative that people could embrace. It is an abstract concept, European Union, difficult to compete with the idea of a nation, of the nation which is so powerful for Poles. But the 1940 Katyn massacre of 22,000 Polish officers murdered by the Soviet secret police, it's not an abstract concept. But for a long time, a forbidden story to talk about it, kept alive uh, though for generations, even if only through whispers. So when in 2010, that airplane with 99 members of the government and parliament on its way to commemoration of the Katyn massacre crashed near Smolensk, it naturally brought Poles together. Everything became clear. Another conspiracy against the Polish nation. The Russians, they, they produced that uh, fog, you know, that didn't allow the... I'm not going to do it, okay? So, um, and with, with this, the mourners really recover the, their identity and their recently confused sense of belonging. The Smolensk community, that's how it was called. Uh, gathered every month, uh, you know, they were called kind of not anniversaries because it's not every month um, in front of the presidential palace. And, uh, um, okay, let me just stop right here. It, and therefore, community was created. The community was created. Um, is thus, uh, so, small communities, thus a community obliged to guard the truth. It emerged as a community obliged to, to guard the truth, to guard the dignity of those who perished, and in the process, to recover their own sense of identity and their place in today's Poland, on the other side of the canyon of mistrust. If indeed people engage with narratives more strongly than with any analysis or arguments, we should explore conversation as an infrastructure for telling and exchanging stories. Conversation, like attendance at the theater performance, is almost always voluntary, not necessary. First, we have to agree to talk, 
to listen to each other's stories, and through this, to get to know each other. I believe that the process of overcoming mistrust and mending the torn fabric of society may begin by connecting through our shared knowledge of the locality we know and best understand, and through our most ordinary daily experiences. And above all, as Arendt emphasizes, we simply have to try to think from the point of view of the other. This is why the public square is so crucial for us. The reality experienced there and together with others makes possible to examine the perilous, in my opinion, problem of misknowing. Let me finish with a brief vignette that I found both hopeful and instructive. Actually, there will be two vignettes. We are in the town of Cieszyn in southern Poland, small town, 40,000 people, on the Polish Czech border, where since last October, Every day at five o'clock, a young woman named Gabrysia Lazarek, a hairdresser, stands alone on the market square with a handwritten poster. Stop hostility and hate. Indifference is acquiescence. If you are not indifferent, stand with me for five minutes. She's still there, not alone anymore. But in the meantime, she and her new friends from the Cheshire Square have established an electoral committee to guard the upcoming elections. There is a fear of electoral fraud, a very strong fear. Um, uh, to guard the upcoming elections to local self-government in Poland. Its name is Siwa. <laughs> Electoral committee called Shiwa, which means might. Electoral committee might. <laughs> and it could be also translated as, I think, strength, but it's difficult to say. And, and finally, let me mention a very recent case of performativity in defiance of the shrinking public square, this time in Washington, D.C. The square that emerged before our eyes was tiny. It was that Senate elevator in which two women addressed Senator Flake, who happened to be followed by a TV camera. And so we all saw it, as though we were there. Here is Maria Gallagher. I understand that you just said last night that the witness was not that credible. Look at me. I'm talking to you. You are telling me that my assault doesn't matter, that what happened to me doesn't matter. And then Anna Maria Rekchila. I have two children and cannot imagine that for the next 50 years they will have to have someone in the Supreme Court who is accused of violent, violating a young girl. What are you doing, sir? Perhaps as usual, I'm too optimistic, but these words acted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. I don't, I'm not expecting any questions. I, I suddenly discover a runny nose and I, I developed a runny nose yeah, on the way here. But if you have a question, I'm here, of course, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Hannah Arendt, and her thesis, of course, is the banality of evil. And a concern that I've had for some time is that uh, the majority of members of Congress seem to me to be really banal. They're not accepting responsibility. They are, I think, just in, in it for themselves at the moment. And they've been in there too long. That, uh, as you all saw on TV, certain of the senators during the grilling of Dr. Ford were also there during the grilling of attorney Anita Hill, except they just had darker hair and more of it. And that's the only difference. One, even, uh, one of them even, I think, uh Yes, right. Announce it. You know, I know it. I've been here before, and I yeah. yeah, and 
But I'm just concerned that um, some of the people really don't care. Those who should care, those who could care and make a difference, don't. That's where evil becomes banal. And they say, oh, the people above us, they, they told us to do this. We know the theories, we've been there. So I just thought I'd throw that back to you for a moment. Uh, I think this is an interesting, uh, an interesting observation. I, um, um, I think that Hannah Arendt's thesis um, about Eichmann, concerning Eichmann, is problematic. But I think it's interesting that what you just said actually goes along with some of her um, characterization, characteristics of Eichmann as a administrator, as a, as a clerk, as somebody who takes things for granted and, 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 takes, and takes orders uh, from the from from Hitler, <laughs> you know, basically. So I think that that's something that 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 thread is here actually interesting, and yeah, and 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 somewhat similar. Um, but as you know, it is a, otherwise. It is a, not not everybody would agree with her that that um, that that makes him. This is a, again a, one of the dimension of um, of Eichmann, and some people would say there is much more to it. Yeah. Elsbieta, you mentioned a few times public happiness, and public happiness and democracy, both two noble objectives of an enlightened society, but aren't they occasionally in conflict, and how do you reconcile those? Um, here is the problem that I have with liberal democracy, or rather with liberalism, liberalism as, as such. And I'm fully committed to liberal democracy, I have to say. But I, I would like, I would like to think um, that there is another yet element beyond civil society, or not necessarily civil society, which, which warms up, <laughs> which provides. And I'm not, I'm not into emotion. I'm not talking about, but which warms up, or brings a kind of a. A, a sense of a, of a shared humanity to uh, to what is known as a liberal democracy. Uh, liberalism is a is a is a philosophy of walls, right? I, it is you know here is my here is my world, and my world should not be um, the government should be should not be nosy, should leave me alone. This is my private. And this is my, pri I mean, and, and, I'm, and I'm an actor, and I'm a creator of my own, uh, I'm sculpting my own life. Um, that incredible um, emphasis on an individual, I think it's absolutely fantastic. But there is somewhat in democracy, in the, in the and I think classical mostly theory, uh, liberal theory, and there is a coldness, and um, that's why I wanted to actually. I, 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 I'm arguing that it doesn't have to be that figuring out things together that solve conflicts and problems and create a better life for all of us. It's something that makes people, makes us incredibly happy. And I think that maybe we're missing. You know, that maybe there is not enough of um, um, maybe liberal liberalism taking. Uh, um, <laughs> Exactly, you know, or in a, uh, does not does not help us with that. So, um, hence, I kind of try to argue that that performative element of it, if it's not completely forgotten or betrayed, is something that could help out. So, I I do see a problem there, but I think there might be ways of um, solving it. I'm pro I probably didn't answer your question, but it's not an easy question. Yeah. Well, I think what you're saying is the difference of complacency because we're happy right here in our little circle and we tend to not look beyond our circle and to see all of the other things that are happening around us. Yeah. And I think as Americans, we have become complacent. And we just saw this movie, um, 
yesterday. Oh, Fahrenheit. And mm -hmm. the movement of the young people from Parkland in Florida has already created a movement that I was listening to NPR on the way mm -hmm. here of change for gun laws. And those young people have made a difference in, I think it was at least five states now that are adopting to not use the automatic, whatever it's called, a bumper or something, and to address the idea of who's buying the guns and not giving the guns to somebody who has a record to, That's right. to, to flag them. I think it's called red flag. But this is where we are all in here. We need more young people. We need to get this out. I would try to warn you. One of the most difficult, I was talking here about this uh, um, SMS and about uh, how, how many elderly people are supporting um, the ultra-right wing uh, uh, parties in Poland, but I have to say that one of the most aggressive, uh, and I, uh, it's hard to believe, are uh, groups and um, who, who launched various organizations which are semi-fascists are very young people. I'm talking about Poland, right? Yeah. Very young people, well and not necessarily simple or simplistic. They're well educated. And you know, it makes me, and I am a university teacher, so I know it, it, it kind of it, it gives me a goosebumps. I'm, I'm very, very, very upset. I, can't, I, I, I don't know people like that, but I've been um, having more and more conversation. I'm, um, I'm in the process of writing a book which is, which is called Democracy After Violence, and I'm very interested in the, and, and, and those are the dangerous um, kind of, so, so I, I, I learned that it is young people who are, you know. Okay, but you're looking, I mean, this all, remember the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Right. So the people that have been pushed into this movement and encouraged by our current Mm -hmm. Right. Um, are one category of yeah. young people. Yeah. And sadly, yes. Yes. But the young people from Parkland are a different category Fanta. of That's people. That's right. And those young people, you know, I don't know what the balance number wise, but they have created a movement where typically red states are now adopting better gun laws. No, no, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do have, yeah. unfortunately, which is like somebody just at the anthill, and they're all coming up and becoming more out there and more verbal than yeah. before because, you know, and it, we've seen it. it's okay to, you know, teach a two-year-old to shoot or yeah. a four-year-old. I mean, we're, we see this side. But another question. Yeah. Over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, You've covered a lot of ground. Um, I know. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, one thing that, that disturbed me a little bit was um, one of the references you made about flyover country and the people on the coast not talking to the uh, to people in flyover country. And you began your lecture with a quote from the New York Times, all the news that's fit and, uh, to print, and democracy dies in darkness, the, the Washington Post. Uh, it seems to me that we've had performance democracy going on for about 25 years. It's called Rush Limbaugh, it's called Glenn Beck, it's called Fox News, and they've been telling the flyover country in particular that you can't trust anybody who reads the New York Times, you can't trust the Washington Post, you can't trust their fact. Uh, and uh, so when you, when you lecture and you say that the onus is all on the coasts, where most of the people live, uh, where they contribute more to the government than they take, as opposed to fly out, flyover country, which takes more from the government than they contribute. Um, I, I am a little bothered by the one-sidedness of that. Mm -hmm. And I understand the difficulty in trying to dialogue with people who have been told, don't believe, you know, don't believe facts. Uh, don't believe in these things. They're, the liberals are ruining your mind, they're ruining our country. How do you see breaking through that or having the other side join in a dialogue or reaching out? 
I, I agree with you. This is, uh, I, I was trying to make it sh as sharp as possible, and I did say also that this is to, uh, trying, I, I, I do think that we always should start with ourselves, and that's why I was looking for the, uh, for the answer, you know, who is guilty, and that's where I, um, where I start. But I think when I, there was also a moment, and maybe not emphasized enough, at the end, when I, I do see an incredible difficulty of, uh, of bridging that gap or that canyon of mistrust. I do. But I think that it ought to start with local things, no, not, with, not, with a, not with the systemic, uh, not with the government, and not necessarily with the parliament. I mean, we all see that. But when it comes for people to try to, to walk in the other the, in the shoes of the others they just have to start and the, and the issues are related to local communities and that is something that i think people do have in common and they share and if they start working together on that i think something could change um, i like to be optimistic i absolutely agree with you i have to say that my flyover country um, uh, kind of parable was um, it was related to the fact that I quite recently read that that play theater play as you may know I, I'm, I theater is a big part of my inspiration and then and then I perhaps went overboard with that but uh, it's an old play and doesn't really it doesn't really explain much but it's a but there is something about um, about those people feeling like uh, like they don't, nobody, 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 nobody cares about them. But I do think there is this platform. I think that there is this, um, the, the, uh, there is a possibility, a strong possibility, and I think that that's how it starts in a local community. I, 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 I live in New York, but I also have um, uh, live part time in upstate New York in a very small place, which is clearly a Trump country, <laughs> and. Um, and it's um, and I can see how important it was that we built a little park together in that village that we are, and that you know, now we can talk about it. And yeah, it, it seemed as though we are going to elect somebody else there in that little Jeffersonville. And it's um, and I don't you know and I and I, I I don't want to I don't want to go into but that there is something that makes me feel better that it was, and only maybe because I spent a semester, last semester, there being a sabbatical, so I had really more time to, to, to meet people and to talk to people. And those are our neighbors that we loved. We just didn't know much about their political, political um, opinions or political positions. And they, they liked us, so they actually, we can talk. I mean, there has to be some situation that, you know, it has to, has to be somewhat, um, uh, 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 a moment created in which people can talk to each other. You cannot talk to somebody who, you know, who uses hate all the time. So this is, this is obviously not possible. There are some other ways to create, to create, and you know that might be naive what I'm saying, but that that comes from my experience. Mm -hmm. I do have one thing to say, and you'll understand this. For, besides, thank you for opening our minds. But uh, if you recall well, that my first book was called Democracy is a Discussion. Yay! <laughs> I think this is a group that loves and adores discussion, as you'll see. So there's some hope in um, Scranton, right. Pennsylvania, yeah. just Absolutely. like Jeffersonville. <laughs> and thank you so much. I just didn't have any